on Facebook, I have come across conversations, uh, posts, and also videos wherein Christians and some others uh, have said that B the BLM agenda is Marxist, anti-family, and antithetical to Christianity. Marxist, anti-family, and antith antithetical to Christianity. And so what do you say in response to people who have this uh, framework or understanding? I would say that the Black Lives Matter movement is a birthing that comes out of the Black liberation struggle, which comes out of Black Christianity and Black faith in America. When we look uh, and we look at our ancestry, we look at what, we, what they call slave religion, okay? When you look at slave religion and there was always two preachers in slave religion. There was always the preacher that came forward and said exactly what the slave master told him to say. Read from Colossians and said, slaves obey your masters for this is right in the Lord. And then at night, once that preacher had left, another preacher would stand up and that preacher would tell them to straighten up your back because you are God's child. That preacher would tell them you can go on a little bit further because everything is going to be all right. If you listen to a spiritual, you will know that there was always something birthed. And that birthed the abolition movement. You don't get Underground Railroad without folks hearing that, understanding that, and creating something new. It was hated by mainstream Christianity because mainstream Christianity in America is often westernized, right? And is talking about manifest destiny and how white is right in a lot of ways. When you look at the text, scripture, Jesus, let's go back to Jesus. I always start with the text. Jesus, right, uh, starts his ministry by saying the spirit of the Lord is upon me, right? Jesus' context is a Jewish, brown skin, cinnamon color, you know, darker hue brother, living in a Roman empire of oppression. Yes, sir. So let's talk yes, about sir. it. Right? right? So that's, that's the text. So we want to go straight to the scripture. Let's, let's start there. And then Jesus finds his ministry from the minute he, he said the spirit of the Lord is upon me, right? Until the end of his ministry, the majority of Jesus' ministry takes place in the streets, not in the temple. And who is Jesus talking to in the streets? He's talking to the people who are possessed uh, by demons. He's talking to those who are sick and want to be made whole. He is talking uh, to those who are, believe that there is something more in store for them, that God truly values their life. Jesus' whole message is love your neighbor as you love yourself and to love one another because he's telling you you have value. The same thing happens in slave religion. The same things happen uh, in the AME church. The same things happen uh, in the 60s and beyond. It is reorientating uh, the family. It is reorientating and saying we take care of those who are hurt, who are left out, and who was lost. Black Lives Matter, literally, uh, we and Reverend Lawson talked about this, and we were amazing, uh, reminiscing about this. Now, Black Lives Matter starts its genesis at people who have been cast out by society. Black Lives Matter is a movement that goes to families whose parents, whose children have been killed and slaughtered by the oppression system, much like the Roman Empire would do, and says, you matter. We're not going to leave you out. We're going to lift you up until you get freedom, because justice looks like your son or, or daughter being here with you, but until you get some modicum of freedom. And they have literally become almost like a pastoral ministry Mm. So many families across this nation who have lost loved ones at the hands of police, right? That's what Black Lives Matter is doing. It's a very much a sacred uh, movement in that way. I see it as a continuation of what Jesus is trying to get to do anyway. Move outside of the temple. Go and meet people in the streets. Be like Paul and speak the language of the people, but don't go against uh, the will of God. And tell those who have been cast out, Tell the woman caught in adultery. Tell uh, the person who has the demon. Tell the person with the issue of blood who is forced to live on the outside of her community, although uh, she is Jewish and is at the pool, that she, there is still place. Tell the Sumerian that you are welcome in. Black Lives Matter has thrown a tent that says, if you are black, 
no matter what your infirmity, no matter what your ailment is, that there is a place for you. I think the church is supposed to be doing that same exact work. So I would, I would challenge us to ask one, who is the Jesus, if you are a Christian, that you, that, you, that you pray into? Who is the Jesus that you are worshiping and walking with? Because last time I checked, Jesus was lynched on a tree as a political prisoner because yes. the day, a couple of days before, he went into the temple and threw over tables. That's called disruption. That's called protest. That's called civil disobedience. He threw over tables and said, you have made my father's house, right? Mm-hmm. A house of thieves instead of a house of prayer for all people, mm-hmm. right? That's why Jesus was killed. You have to be truthful about that, right? Yes. He was executed by the state. And so the Jesus that shows up in our lives and shows up in the street is the same Jesus that says, I did it raised from the dead for you to go back into the temple and sit down with people who are stealing from my people who are oppressing uh, my, my folks. God is calling us, I believe. Mm-hmm. God is calling us into the street. And I'll just say this for those who, who like the Hebrew text. Uh, and I'm going to say this too, my Jewish sisters and brothers, when you read, the calling of Moses. God tells Moses that would you go, and this is, and I'll say this because some people say, you know, defunding the police and all this stuff is too radical. And I say, it's also kind of biblical. Because <laughs> God tells Moses, when you go to Pharaoh, you're going to tell Pharaoh, the one who's oppressing my people, they, they treat it okay, but they're still being oppressed. And God said, tell, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh will tell you no but I will compel him with a mighty hand. And then God says this to Moses, and when you leave Egypt, you will not leave empty handed. Hallelujah. (laughs) All Black Lives Matter is saying in this moment is we are leaving the Egypt of oppression, of racism, of systematic racism, of police brutality. And when we leave, we're not leaving empty handed. We're gonna leave with the resources to reinvest in our community. That's what defund the police uh, means. And I just want to put it in the script, put, show you the biblical parallels. Mm-hmm. Because oftentimes it's easy for us to demonize what we don't understand. It's easy for us to demonize and say, that's not the way of Jesus. But I also remind all of my older saints out there that at Dr. King's height of popularity, he was only accepted 13% right. by even the black community and was considered a terrorist and a threat to American democracy. Yes, awesome, awesome, awesome. So very powerful um, uh, discussion mm-hmm. and description about that. And, uh, and what, I, what I think too, you know, talking about the Marxist mm-hmm. part, the anti-family part, and you showed us clearly how the work is Christian. <laughs> the work is the gospel, right? But but even if there are some things that we disagree with, um, there are intersections that we do agree with, right? Mm-hmm. Much like in the 1960s when the civil rights movement was going on, you had uh, SNCC, a uh, student mm-hmm. nonviolent coordinating uh, conference uh, where that, that, that John, Congressman John Lewis led for at, at least three years as the chairperson, you have the Nation of Islam under the direction of Elijah Muhammad that was there. Uh, you, you did have uh, El Haj Malik El Shabazz Malcolm, who had separated from the Nation of Islam at that time. You, you, do, you did have the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Convention. You had the NAACP. You had the Urban League. We had all of them who had oh, even the Black Panther Party. So you had all of these groups who had a particular interest or cause who did good work, right? And they had particular agendas. And we were able to coalesce in ways. Mm -hmm. and come together around those things that we agreed with, largely for the liberation of Black people, (laughs) right? For the liberation of Black people. And so I say to those who get hung up on one thing or the other, get over it, right? Get over it and understand that uh, in, in order for the United States government to work, the independence 
and the Republicans and the Democrats have to get together. They have to negotiate. They have to cooperate. They have to coalesce for anything to pass. That's, that's, that's the way it's designed. That's the way it's designed. So collaboration uh, is critical here. And so I, I say to Black folks, let's get free first. <laughs> yeah. And let's split hairs later. Let's yeah. get free first. Put that on a, on a ban or a banner. Let's get free first and split hairs later. Sound like you want to get in on that. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, this is a leaderful movement. And I think that's also where folks have to, to, to realize, you know, the Marxist comments and stuff like that. Yeah, there's not a single leader yeah. of Black Lives Matter. Right. That's true. Yeah. It's leaderful. But so was, as Dr. Katami just pointed out, so was the 60s, right? It was leaderful. And though uh, we, you know, I, we pay homage and we thank God for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and, and Malcolm X, who, who really are, you know, two barons, the titans who, who everyone knows. There were tons of leaders. You know, Fannie Lou Hamer was doing her work, right? <laughs> you know, there was tons of leaders who, uh, Mega Evers was doing work, right? You know, there was tons of leaders who made this movement happen. The same thing is happening here. Uh, and, and I would say just figure out where you fit in, because as Dr. King says, it will be a shame for you to be asleep during a revolution. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So uh, we're kind of getting close to our end now. So let me ask you, what are some of the important social justice initiatives that you have worked on and which one or two might have been the most gratifying, uh, would you say? Yeah. I think um, one of the biggest gratifying moments that I worked on was getting cash bail uh, out of California. Mm. The reason I'll tell you why, because I wasn't really, you know, I had to read up on it and to learn a lot about it. But I realized that the bail industry was preying on black people and poor black people in particular and was creating almost like this debtor system in our state. Um, and so that was a big lift and we got that changed on a, on a state level. Um, and then I would say the other work uh, is uh, with Black Lives Matter. Um, right now, I think is the moment where we are seeing uh, tectonic shifts in legislation and policy that talk about investment in black community and divestment from systems that harm us. And so right now, you know, across this country, there are over probably 20 cities, major cities, that are considering cutting the budgets of police and investing in the needs of black communities. Now, now that's massive. That's monumental, and I, and, I, and I hope people are like really leaning in and just watching that. Reverend Lawson said this to me, he said, what you all are doing now wasn't even possible in the 60s. In the 60s, we were trying to get people to realize we were human, right? And that's why, you know, people talk about respectability politics, that's why people wore suits. Right, we were continuing the fight that Frederick Douglass was doing. We took pictures every couple of years, reminding people we are human. Now, it's no longer reminding you that we are human. We are demanding that you treat us as such. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we are seeing across the nation now is the biggest and most gratifying uh, thing that I've been a part of. Uh, it includes the Portland's campaign. Everything is really constant you know, coalescing at this moment uh, for something really big to happen uh, in our nation. We've seen the BREATHE Act be proposed on a national scale. We've seen um, legislation and city councils adopt amendments. And I think right now, uh, the future is kind of like scripture. It doesn't yet appear what God has in store for black people, but I know it's going to be good. Mm -hmm. I know that we will live in a different reality after this moment and that God will not have to repent for making us in this moment.